in a world crying out for Thunderdome. Thunderdome. The fans have spoken. Two films enter. One film leaves. The top ten gives you a reckoning by the name of Thunderdome. Thunderdome. Brought to you by the Schmoes No Network. Take it away, boys. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Thunderdome. Thunderdome! <laughs> I kind of missed that false set. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done one of these. Uh, and so I was looking forward to it today. Yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a good uh, uh, choice between the two movies. Yeah. I don't know where Walter Matthau was uh, the choice. I loved and then it. Then boom, was, charade, was... and then uh, take him a poem one, one, two, three were yeah. the two movie choices. What, what interesting choice to choose Walter yeah. Matthau, right? And then also to choose those two from his canon of films. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> Because Pelham, he's part of an ensemble on some level. He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, a charade, it's not really a Mathow. Like, it it's is. It's not really about him. Yeah, but it's not. He's. It, not to say that it, he's not great. Oh, of course. Uh, but there's so many other films we could cho- choose where he yeah. is the lead or the co lead. It's him and someone else. I thought for sure uh, Bad News Bears was going to be in contention. Yeah, or? that or potentially Grumpy Old Men. Grumpy Old Men, sure. Like one of those two, because. Younger, yeah. younger generations might have seen because they're more accessible comedies. Right. I would have even accepted Hello Dolly. I would have accepted that. Okay. I mean, there's a multiple things you can go with. A front page? The Odd Couple? Odd Couple is another, but I, I still couple, think yeah. I still think Bad News Bears yeah. and Grumpy Old Men are the two entry points for anybody that's under the age of, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, who's listening to us. Yeah, who didn't grow up with Walter Matthau, because I didn't really. Like, kind of, but not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he had already been around for 30 years by the time I knew who he was. Right. So he was established, so somebody my parents knew very well. They yeah. was like a Tom Hanks to them. Like, I know everything about that guy kind of thing. That's awesome. Uh, uh, real quick, I want to give a shout out to Josh Mabry. He's one of our fans. And uh, Christian uh, took me into the room here at Collider today, and I talked to him real quick. He's a, he's a Patreon uh, a donator to the Schmodown, mm-hmm. but he's a big fan of our top 10. He listens to the show. He's a big fan of Outlaw Nation. He's a big fan of you, uh, Matt. And so he just, we talked for like two minutes, but I just wanted to give him a shout out because he was like really complimentary. And he said, You guys just get it. And that's what I enjoy listening to your show every week. What was you his guys, name again? Josh Mabry, M A B R Y. And he said, Your Patreon's next. I promise. I'm going to start donating to you. Well, let's fucking guys. do it, Josh. <laughs> Enough of this goddamn <laughs> hammering and hawing. I'm on the fence, man. Get with Commit. the program. Yeah, seriously. Uh, Shit no, no, no. the pot. Hey, Thanks for supporting the Schmodown. Yeah. Know? Um, and support you know, whatever, us. Whatever you can do. But the, this is now a Patreon show that yeah. everybody gets to listen to. But yeah. if you're part of the Patreon, you get in the mix. So we draw three names and those three people. First guy gets to tell us what it's going to be. And then the yeah. next two pick the two movies. And then we have a vote. Yeah. And so like this was lopsided. Taking a Pelham I mean, just crushed. Yeah. No, it had no, no shot. surprise. Charade had no shot. No. Like 10 people have seen Charade. It was uh, Eric Grebner gave us uh, Charade. Okay. And he was like, I know it's going to lose kind of thing. You're like, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you recognize that beforehand. You're not uh, operating under false delusions. Right. Uh, I, well, I respect the fact that he was willing to, you know, uh, take the hit just to stand for a movie that he loves. You got to yeah, respect maybe, That's why people love films. Maybe somebody now will go out and watch that because yeah, of that. True. Good point. But yeah, Frank Montoya is the one that set the... Uh, uh, the topic, so he okay. chose Walter Matthau, and then it was Eric Grebner and Mitch Newman. So Mitch Newman, you're our winner. Congratulations, you're my da, 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 da. You chose a winner. Uh, yeah. I think it won like three to one voting wise. Wow, something something along those lines. That's what they call a whooping. It was it was pretty. It was a curb stop. <laughs> curb stop. That wasn't even close. <laughs> Whereas like Master and Commander, yeah, the last oh, one. Oh, that was great. That. That came down to a matter of fractional votes. What a great battle that was. That was a great battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, on this one, if we're going to talk about Mathau of the two, I'd rather yeah. talk about taking Pelham one, one, two, three, because he's got Me a bigger too. part. There's more Mathau in it. Yeah, and it's an unusual kind of Mathau, too, because by this point, he is what? He's in his 60s, 50s, something like that, don't you think? This is what, 1974? Four, 1974. 
Um, he was born I would in say 1920. So he's, he's in. He's 54 when this comes out. Okay, I was going to say like 61 or 62. Yeah, he looks that. like he's in his 60s though. Maybe just because he's always been old to me. Yeah, I mean, he really has. <laughs> he's always been even, even of that age. It's just like, he's an old man. He plays an old man, and yeah. he's, he's awesome. Who doesn't love Walter Matthau? Him and Jack Lemmon have always just been old to me in my mind. 100%. <laughs> they, they have that essence, you know? Although, <laughs> Jack stands out more because he's got uh, a bunch of younger ones that are kind of classics. Yeah, sure, sure. Some like it hot and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the you, you would have seen. Yeah. But at the same time, like, uh, he is kind of an old man. <laughs> yeah. So there's nothing against that. Yeah, right. That one's great, though. It's got a great cast. It does, man. You got Matthew, you got Robert Shaw. You yes. You got uh, Jerry Stiller. Yes, you, you do. Hector Elizondo. Elizondo is so unrecognizable. Ooh, I saw a week and a half ago. Yes, let's I, talk about this. I text John, I'm like, hey, 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 I'm in Ojai. I'm getting dinner. I almost, I th- Hector Elizondo is here. I almost went up to him and asked him if he'd like to do the show. And John was like, "You go do it, yes, right now." And be like, "No, man, because he's probably here on vacation, just like I am, like yeah. a little escape, and he's there with his wife." <laughs> it's the same thing I'm doing. You enjoy it. You enjoy. I tried. I tried to push him. I tried to push Matt. I was like, yeah, "No, go talk to him. No. you will love it." I yeah, look, trust me. I, Matt's more very respectful. Guy. I love Hector Elizondo. Well, who doesn't? He, the guy is awesome in every movie, even if the movie's not good. Yeah, I still appreciate the living shit out of him in it. Yep. Uh, you know. Pretty necessary woman. roughness, right? Necessary roughness. Pretty woman. He's got a small part in. Yeah. To uh, you know, uh, the guy's worked nonstop for forty some odd years. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. At this point, he can just do a job when he wants to. Well, that's what's great about them. Martin Balsam is the other guy who's the guy that survives all the way to the end. Martin Balsam. That's the oh, actor. Okay. That's the, he was in Psycho. He's in a number of movies all through the fifties and sixties. There's Very a bunch of the seventies. Famous actors. Well, a yeah. few actors. The deputy mayor. Yes. Uh, yeah. Shit, who else was in that? I think the police colonel might have been one of those. Oh, yeah, I remember him in like three, four things. Right. In the 70s. There's, uh, a, there's a bunch of good, because it's a huge ensemble. Yep, it is. A the, lot. Of- uh, the new female worker in Grand Central, or like the Central Station that eventually the, the boss of that has to go down and get shot. Oh, right. I know I've seen her in like numerous right. things for the past 40 years. Well, the, the, uh, the, wife, the mayor's wife is Doris Roberts, who was okay. uh, Ray, and Everybody Loves Didn't Raymond. I realize that. Yeah, it was the mom and Everybody Loves Raymond. So, yeah, a lot of really great actors in this thing. And it was so fun to revisit it for the podcast, Matt, because I'd seen it for the first time like two years ago on TCM. Really? Yeah, I'd never, it's one of those ones that had just escaped me through the 70s. Like there's, every once in a while there's like these films that I've always meant to go see okay. and and, did, and I never saw the remake, the Denzel Washington Travolta I one. saw that. Yeah. Did you like it? Is it a good no. remake? No. Okay, okay. This one, this one, it's just so, an un, such an unusual film in this film of 70s, right? You have Hackman, mm-hmm. you have all these other type of guys that are coming into prominence in the 70s and then you have Walter Matthau, this guy who was like famous in the 50s and the 60s but like it can he make the transition? And this is a gritty film. He's a he's a guy who's like leading a tour, uh, and then all oh, of a he's sudden being, he's being so demeaning to these people because he doesn't yeah. think they understand English. He's yeah. not like trying to. He's like, all right, follow me. Like he just keeps calling them weird, different, yeah. bad things. But you know what, man? I also appreciate the honesty of it. Yeah. Uh, like at one point, there's a there's a, a black police officer that manages to be the first on the scene, right? And the underground. Whatever, and uh, he, he he's talking to his lieutenant. He's I think he is a transit cop. Yeah, happens to be down the track, and he calls into his lieutenant. And he's like, "All right, we'll tell the you know city cops that are showing up here, yeah. the snipers, uh, don't fire me. Let them know that I'm here because I kind of blend in." <laughs> oh god! And so it's a, it might not be wow. that specific a wording, yeah. but it's right along those lines. But at the same time, that is a joke between friends, mm-hmm. but that is also a remind them. Yeah. Remind them I'm down here, but yeah. it's a nice, soft way of doing it. We obviously have known each other. There's a casualness, like yeah. the, the guy that the transit worker that gets shot. He's making inappropriate, or he's saying inappropriate things within a workplace and whatnot. Right. He's like, just because they hired a woman now and she's got to be around, she's got to learn the way. If you got to run the transit, you're going to curse. <laughs> like this is a man's world kind of thing. But at the same time, that seemed more honest. Yeah, I would rather have that as opposed to no, no. We were all very respectful. So yeah. Like, no, yeah. people talk the way they talk. Well, I, I always, and I think this is interesting, Matt, because I haven't grown up, and people don't, people aren't as old as, as me. Like, I grew up during a time like that where you spoke about it openly. Like, you 
talked about it, and it, it was almost a respect in that way because you knew where everybody stood, one way or another. You know what I'm saying? You knew. And so nowadays everyone is so touchy and sensitive about everything. You can't have an honest conversation about these kinds of things. No. You can't have a film like this that like uses these words in a certain way because people get super offended. And I get why. And listen, I'm one of those people that sometimes will get offended by a way a certain thing is presented in a film. But when you go back and watch these 70s films and the 70s TV shows, Mm -hmm. they're very frank about race in a way that's not like trying to be offensive or trying to be anything other than being honest and real and accepting a basic foundation of... A tenant of life. Yes. People are people. Yes. And, right. and, and that's why I like, like you bring up a great point. That's what was so enjoyable about that moment in the movie. Yeah. But, and yeah, they, they did it several times and they didn't go yeah. for like the grotesque version of it. It yes. was more the casual every day. We're all trying to live our lives here. Right. So I am this offensive to you. Well, guess what? I am that offensive to that person yeah. and that person <laughs> yes. and that person. Like the guy that's, that's running uh, the main station where Mathal is right. situated most of the time, right. he says some terrible things. He like, really does. I, I don't care about 18 people. All my trains are kind of down. But it's not some grandstanding thing. They're trying to make the character have a moment. Right. He's just flustered and pissed, and he's an old yeah. man, and he's used to his world and being yeah. a certain way. And you eventually see his humanity, but it's not like you're denied of it the rest of the time. He's mm-hmm. just, you know, damn it. I'm used to the world going one way, and I already right. have enough frustrations in my life kind of thing. It's a more natural Human reaction yeah. to that situation. Yeah, and you have to think about the time in the 70s, people are transitioning from that flower power shit from the 60s and marching yeah. and all that kind of jazz. And then Vietnam happens, which really warps a lot of people, and you have more of a rawness in the country. So that's going to come through in the art that you create. And so you see it very clearly in this movie as well. I think. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, as, as this country was grappling with the idea of, you know, there's a decade after uh, Martin Luther King, and yeah. I have a dream, and trying to create equality within all citizens. And we're still, as a society at that time, they're still, you know, wrestling with yeah, it. Yeah. And some people were not comfortable. They've been raised an entire, right. from day one, no, this, yeah. it's this way. And you have to educate. It takes generations, unfortunately, yeah. to get something that ingrained out of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I do agree with you. I mean, it, it is us being curmudgeonly old men, but yeah. it, it is a, an age of... Everything offends me. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Welcome to real life. <laughs> like you're gonna get offended. It's inevitable. Yeah. A- unless you live in a tiny little fucking bubble. So yeah. move on. Yeah. I like agree. there are times when I do think the outrage is real, but others are just like, yeah, you know, I, I can't name an example now because I, uh, whatever. I'm fucking no, tired. No, but- you get a, you, some people feel put upon to create a a uh, frustration or an anger or racism or an offense. That wasn't intended. It yeah. wasn't... Looking for it. Right. It, yeah. Right. By the same token, other people are unwilling to be educated about the possible offense. And that's where we find the division, in, my, in my opinion, is too many people get too upset about things that are not meant to be upsetting in its intent. Uh, and then too many people on the other side use it as use that offense, misguided offense, as an excuse to not care about any offense and not try to understand where that offense might have come from and that kind of and that's where we find I think our break in connection so in understanding this situation yeah yeah, yeah I mean you know whatever yeah. let's see if that actually changes that, that could be one of those things that it's been a, a song as old as time kind of thing yeah yeah uh, because you know I, I don't care every generation is done with the, these kids today oh yeah it's always happened of course and I've I, I read uh, what was it a great note from like the 1800s about a school teacher upset that chalkboards were basically that was like a leading technology <laughs> and by giving it to kids it was going to distract them and then you're like wow and then from that like chalkboards and also like writing utensils yeah. and, and whatnot and you're like something that's going to only foster it because it was the new technology you're right. like no nah, these kids today are lazy <laughs> with their pen and paper like i drew in the sand to do calculations kind of Somehow they're worse, and you're like, it's the, it, we've all been saying this shit. Uh, when abacus is the height of technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look at him trying to do math over there. I do it in my head. And that's why there's limitations on this strata uh, of the society. We can only get so far. That's fucking brilliant. Well, anyway, the movie, it, it's, it's about these uh, uh, thieves who get on a train, and, it, I, and Tarantino steals liberally from this in Reservoir Dogs because they're all different colors. Oh, yeah. Mr. Blue, Mr. Brown, Mr. Green, whatever. Um, and as Matt mentioned, it's Robert Shaw, Hector Alexander, Martin Balsam. I don't know who the other guy is who's like who has the stutter. Uh, I forget who that actor is. He, they're all part of it. And, you know, they all find their different ways to 
stand out. Robert Shaw is. It's so interesting to see him in any film other than Jaws. It's still. It's a real culture shock for me in my mind. Because like, he he is Quint. He really is Quint, man. But it's, he's always excellent. Yes, he's good. He's a great dad. Doesn't matter. Like the Sting. Yeah. Absolutely. He's, he's awesome in the Sting. He has that Fuck. presence, but for some reason, I just want to see him on a boat. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I, I want to see you like, shit, you should have been like a, a disheveled captain in something, <laughs> yeah. another something like that. Well, the deep, he's good in the deep, but it's not necessarily the same character. And he's, you know, it is the, the water and stuff like the treasure and all that he'd jazz. Be a good, yeah, submarine captain. Yeah. Oh, he'd have been a he'd great, been a submarine, great captain. submarine captain. You could see the hat just kind of askew, the hair sticking out from under. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And everything's night. falling apart around yeah. him. And he's just yelling it to, to pull his men back in. But ultimately, <laughs> there is a disaster on that yeah. submarine. This tale does not end well. I'm not telling you to go left, Charlie. Yeah. I'm telling to go left. Uh, like, you could see, totally see him in that. But I like that Hector Elizondo is so fucking insane. It's yeah. so, so not Doesn't a character you've ever that? seen him play. Because um, I rewatched it for this. I, yeah. I didn't remember, I guess, maybe that the, uh, Shaw says that he doesn't trust him because he's like, he got kicked out of the mob. Yeah. And you're like, what? Everything I've ever seen about the mob is you either die of natural causes or they kill you. There right. is no getting out once you're in. So well, how like, fucked up do you have to be that they asked you to get out yeah. and let you live? <laughs> That's such a... I've never heard that. Like, this, this dude's so nuts. The mob kicked him out. That's Robert Shaw saying it, who was a mercenary yeah. for some African govern, yeah. government or something. Yeah. And you see all this coming on and then you... It's, it's, an, it's a taut T-A-U-T thriller. Like, stuff is going on on the train and then there's a lot of tension between him and, and Walter Matha because Matha's trying to give him what he wants and he's like trying to negotiate this situation as it comes up and mm-hmm. get them their money and then the car crashes and what what's he got to do? He's got to stall. And then you wonder how much, uh, lev- how much l- how leeway uh, Robert Shaw and those thieves are going to give Walter Matthau when they start asking for the sure. things that they want. You know, So you're, like, you're on the edge of your seat through the whole movie, which is great. You know what I love too is so... 1974, yeah. not a lot of this country is familiar with subway systems. That's a good point. And the fact that they're, that he's touring Japanese uh, men from the Tokyo version yeah. of this around yeah, yeah. and giving an explanation to the audience, yeah. here is the infrastructure behind a subway. Yeah. And it's such an interesting way to educate instead of doing exposition if he somehow walked into a room. Yeah. He's allowed to do it to explain to them. And the, the, I mean, my guess is ultimately you could have done it and other ways, but cinema is also growing. Yeah, like that's why you see a progression throughout the seventies where uh, we they, they they went out of their ways to try and inform audiences yeah. and teach on top of telling a good story. Mm-hmm. And this is like, hey, if you've never seen a subway, well, here's the central nervous system of it. It's got cops <laughs> over on this side. Yeah. This is how it would track in the city. And it's like, oh, that's rather interesting. It is pretty crazy when you watch it. And you're like, wow, a cell phone could take care of a few oh, of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not all the problems, but a right. few of these, like instant communication. Yeah. A little bit better than your walkie-talkie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and as the film progresses, it's it's really inventive how they ha- like they just happen to take on a train with an undercover cop in the in the in the passenger mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And how does that work out? And then he like ends up getting involved in the situation. And they're kind of they, these thieves are are smart. They know what they're doing. It's just these little X factors that are always involved when you see these uh, see these films that deal with heists get mm-hmm. involved. You know, like the undercover cop and. Um, the sneezing, all of like all of these little things that kind of uh, give away the stuff. What do you think the motivation is of the one of the four? Yeah, non Hector Elizondo, non former trail rail right. worker, non Robert Shaw. Right, his motivation because they really gave backstory. Yeah, to everybody else but him. He kind of got the short shrift. Yeah, did they say what he was? I don't think so. Okay, um, okay. Maybe. I wanna, but, I, let me look it up while we're talking about because Elizondo, yeah. we got the mafia, and we know that we the did. other dude was. The, he worked for the rail company. Right. And Robert Shaw was just like, basically, there are no more jobs out there. The job market has dried up. Yeah. And so this is basically just another job to me. Yeah. That's how little human life means. Jesus. That's what's so sad. Yeah. That he doesn't do these kind of things. Because he looks like the type of guy that could. Yeah. Whereas Elizondo is straight playing it, I'm Looney Tunes. Yeah. Um, Shaw it does genuinely because of the, the fact that he is is dispassionate about this entire process. Right. It's not that he's not, it's still a militaristic operation, yeah. but you can tell his heart isn't really, like this is his prime goal. Right. Everything he dreamed to be, yeah. he's kind of like, whatever, this is the job and I'm doing the job. He's doing what he has to do. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Blue is a mercenary in Africa. Mr. Green was a motorman caught in a drug bust. Did they say that? There is tension, blue and gray. Uh, blue conf- oh, uh, yeah, blue confides to Green that he believes gray is mad and potential. So gray, I think, is the guy, is Elizondo. 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So you have all of that running through it. So it's it's, just, it's so much tension. I remember him saying that that's, that was his hook kind yeah. of thing. Well, no, that's Green. Green is the, the, the guy that sneezes. So Martin Balsam's character. Yeah, but he's the former uh, rail worker that worked for... That's how he knew so how to motorized. drive. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But he got caught in a drug bust. Um, okay. But they don't say much about uh, Mr. Yeah, I'm Gray. I'm talking about fourth dude. Yeah, because he, he's shot quickly, isn't he? He gets killed? No, he's, no, no. no. Does he's, he survive for a bit? Yeah, he gets shot in the arm. Right, right. Uh, but that's like three quarters of the way through. Oh, okay. With the cop, right? The undercover cop? Is the undercover cop after? eventually takes him out. He yes. gets shot when somebody fires like the sniper. Oh, that's right. Down the alleyway, doesn't he? He yes. gets hit in the arm. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah, eventually he goes down. Yeah. But that's not until the very end. Like oh. there's 10 minutes left after that or something. Yeah, they don't. And the yeah, others don't, don't talk about. Uh, I can't see what, what Gray does, so I don't know. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't remember his it's, hook. Yeah, it's Mr. Blue, Mr. Green, Mr. Gray, Mr. Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fascinating. All right. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, that all goes down. So, the, the, you know, they start to go forward. To the, they want $1 million, which is, in essence, $5 million nowadays. Um, I, I looked up, yeah, yeah, the inflation of what it would have been in yeah. today's money. It's still a lot of money, man. It is a lot of money. $5 million, dude. Um, and they're going to split it, with four, which is interesting, four ways. And you're just like, well, why Don't you think today the minimum would be like $1 million per person? Yes, at least. At least. Just to make it worth it. Cause, Eight, 18 what, million or how many people do they have? 20 million? Where? What do you mean? Yeah, on the train. There were 17 passengers. 17 passengers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Mm-hmm. But do you like this way this progresses, Matt? Did you believe like the, the way it was? And then eventually, you know, Matt Thou leaves the transit area and has to go out and confront this whole situation. Like, do you like how it all went down? Yeah, I thought the, the pacing of it is they kind of ease you into it. Yeah. And... It's not some huge over the top uh, like dramatic action sequence after dramatic action sequence. They're just right. building the tension between, you know, you can't see what the other side is doing. Right. So Mathow and uh, the side of good, yeah, is kind of guessing in the dark. Oh, we think he's going to do it. Like, what, what's his plan? What's his plan? And Mathow right. eventually figures it out in the car. Yeah. It's like, well, why did it stop right there? We don't know. Right. So he's, uh, we should go back. I'm betting everything on this, and there's yeah. hesitation uh, within that. But it's a gamble. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem like a bad gamble considering you have cops on every station platform. So yeah. eventually they're going to have to stop somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I like the progression quite a bit. I appreciate the fact that it doesn't go full blown like French Connection because yeah. it doesn't need to get that gritty, real, mm-hmm. raw. Well, it's uh, a subway station too, man. I, it's like a submarine. So to me, those those thrillers are difficult to pull off. When you get them right, mm-hmm. they're great because it's the the cheat of those movies are. Are there already in, they already inherently have tension because you're yeah. stuck in an, a steel tube in essence. Whether you're under the water or under the ground, you're still stuck in the steel tube True. in essence. So you, what what can happen in that situation? Yeah, you're so, surrounded by death. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like the same as being in a space shuttle or a space station. You're surrounded right. by death at all times. Right. Right. So there's automatic tension. From everybody, even if they're yeah. like nice to each other, there is that underlying, like, <laughs> 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 please, yeah, exactly. please hold together, please exactly. hold together, because you know, yeah, it is not a lot of material, but standing between me and, and <laughs> your yeah. inevitable force. Do you like the score? I loved the score. Yeah, I love it. It's it like it's got very seventies moments. Yes, like bon yes. Up, bon up, like some hi hat <laughs> riding the hi hat. Yes, bon up, bon out. It's just like, yeah, this this is a 70s. Before that became kind of cliche. Yes. In the later 70s. Yeah, yeah. You'd see that on, on TV cop shows. <laughs> just this really bad, like, oh, he's, he's about to get into some shit. Right. Because it'll really amp up when the huge crescendo moments come. So yeah. this is him leading up to. Love that. And I say him because every cop show in the 70s was <laughs> helmed <laughs> by a white man. Yeah. Uh, Except for Policewoman, which was Angie Dickinson. She okay. Had, she had the rare... Female-led cop show. It was really interesting. They reference it in Reservoir Dogs when they talk about it. But yeah, that that um, that's. I love the to the high all that. Hey, yeah, he's riding a hi hat. Yeah. Just like a. <laughs> <laughs> and then you hear the like that kind of stuff coming underneath, which is always great to hear, man. Yeah, it's a it's a mix of horns plus the, you know the rock culture of drums. And, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you got a wah pedal on a guitar. Yeah. Just like a little slight little to get you in the vibe, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing keeps going. The tensions progress between the kidnappers because I don't know with the thieves rather because I don't think they know each other. They don't actually know each other. So they've been brought together for in essence for this uh, uh, heist. And then they end up turning on each other for the most part. And like, you know, uh, the, the Elizondo gets killed. 
Um, then the other guy gets killed. Uh, and then uh, uh, Shaw, who's about to get captured, steps on a third rail, man, yeah. takes himself out, dog. Whoo. Asked, do you have the death penalty here? No, so then I have to spend the rest of my life in jail? Yeah, fuck all that. He chooses death yep. instead. Yeah. Yeah, it's a brave choice. Uh-huh. Knowing he's just like, I'm caught. Uh, I can either die now at his hands or I can die at my own. Yeah. Those are my only two real options. Do you think context is important in a situation like that? Because he's essentially committing suicide. Yeah. What's the difference between him and a person who's depressed sitting in their apartment taking a gun to their head? This guy kills himself, but he kills himself on his terms, kind of? Do you think that's think, why we don't see it the same way when we see it in film that way? Well, because... Because there's kind of respect for it. I, I think with depression, in certain, certain circumstances, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. But so within his, it literally is, it is one or it is the other. Right, Whereas it's depression, it's like, yeah. it's a spectrum. It could be yeah. these things. Right. And this is not, this is, this is, you have two. This is a binary, yeah. a one or a zero, and that is it. Yeah. There's no gray area. Now, what that zero might end up being, like say that's prison or whatnot, maybe that's solitary, maybe you're just in general lockup, but you killed some people, so you're going away for the rest of your life in yeah. the state. Yeah. Sing Sing or some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've never been in depression so bad where I've actually, you know, the individuals that have done that. Right, right. Um, so I don't know what's in a mental state like that. Well, it's fascinating to watch in the film because we let people get away with that and no one goes, oh man, you know, he could have stayed alive and gone to prison. We what, kind of... What kind of life is that? Though? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We kind of, us as viewers watching the film, when we buy into the world of a movie and a character makes that decision, we intrinsically understand the character making the decision because we've gotten to know the character so well and we go, yeah, that makes sense. Well, don't you also view it as it humanizes the character because now sure. if given that choice, it's asking of you. And yeah. There is some honor in that as opposed to just indignantly living in a cell right. the rest of your life. Right, right, right. right. Uh, because that's what everything that you've done up until this point has led you to this moment. Yeah. And uh, you have you know, like a little tip of the cap to that person. You're like, I don't know if I can make that choice. Hopefully I'm never in a situation like that. Yeah. I can't imagine trying to you know hold up a subway train for five million dollars or whatever the inflation ends up being in our, our modern times. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you know, to be put into a situation where I think this is a really good idea. Yeah, it's a weird place to be. It is. It That's is. why very few people do it. Well, do you like the way the movie ends? Like ends like because like after he does that thing and they pursue they they because. Matho has that hunch. She's like, I know it's a former, it's a person, it's an inside job. Mm-hmm. Someone must have known how these subways worked so that they could uh, give the tips to the. To yeah, the, had to. Yeah. And then you're like, how are they going to find this guy? And that's what's interesting because to me, when I'm presented with Walter Matho at the beginning of the movie, I just think he's a regular dude working his job. I don't think he's some kind of massive detective or intelligent No, guy. he looks like he's part of the PR out. force. Yeah, exactly. Because he's getting handed off this duty. He's like, Tours. here you do this. Yeah, you're giving a tour. You're yeah. really good at talking. Yeah. Go ahead and talk. And that's the first thing he does. He turns around and is like, the New York City you know, subway <laughs> system is the largest in the world. It covers 237 miles or whatever it is. He turns right. around they're not following him. He comes back and waves him. And he goes... Right, it's such good acting. Yeah, goes back into and the tonality of what he's saying is almost the exact same. Yeah, as it would be because that is a well-worn record apparently for you. You've yeah. said this little spiel so many fucking times. Yeah, that you're just sick of it. Uh, yeah, it's it's he's excellent in it. Um, I think it's one of those that really holds up. You don't need the action and all the cuts and all that because they keep the tension and the drama up. Yeah. with authentic and real characters and world. Yeah, that. I think it's somewhat timeless. And they lay the groundwork for what's going to catch the last guy. The mm-hmm. whole sneezing in Gesundheit. The whole sne- throughout, yeah. throughout the whole like interaction, you hear this. And it's done from a nice place because Matha is just a, a decent dude. And so he's just saying that. He's not, he doesn't think, oh, I'm going to catch him this way by doing this. Thing. Like, he has no concept that this is going to come into play. And then when they go and figure it out, who, who this guy means, and, and they have the conversation with him. He does a, such a great job, which because Balsam's a great actor, he does such a great job of like, you know, it's telling them like how ridiculous that he was even that he, they could even think he would do something like this, all this kind of, and you buy it. You so it's such a yeah. great job by him that you buy that they buy it. So when they're walking out, you're like, oh shit, this is gonna end like this, like one of those '70s films where someone gets away with it and shit. And then he does the sneeze, which was genius. And then the look on what Matthau's face when he looks at him mm-hmm. with that accuse. Oh man, it's just a great ending. 
I miss those endings in films, dude. I really do. That's why I love the 70s so much as a decade, man. I just, they were, because of the way the world was set up for, for movies at that time, they were allowed to take chances and yeah. do interesting things that, unfortunately, you got to go with a much safer bet these days. Yeah. Uh, you got to make that money, I guess. You do. Well, especially now with there's being so much content mm-hmm. that it's got to be something that is universal in order to turn a profit, it seems like. Right. It's a good point. Especially of a big, you know, of a wide release movie. Yeah. It's got to perform even a simple comedy or something at a level that is mind numbing. If yeah. you told a movie in the 70s, you're not a success unless you cross whatever the 70s equivalent of $100 million. Right. Right. Like something that seems obscene. Yeah. But that's what it's what a big movie release will do. Yeah. Like on a minimum side, depending on the time of year, it fluctuates, but we have an idea of here's where the ceiling is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh anything else you want to say about the film? No, uh, I um I if you haven't seen it before, yeah. It's really excellent. Hopefully we didn't ruin the movie for you. God, I hope we haven't done that. But if either. you've seen the remake, you know, you basically understand Yeah, you get the point. This movie. I saw the remake before I saw the original. Oh wow. Yeah. I wish I hadn't. Yes. Um, the original is so good. It is good. Yeah. It's, but but it's, it's good, though, Matt, that it it's so good that even though you saw the remake first, this one still works for you. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the, the remake, you know, you got Denzel. Denzel yeah. always puts in a quality performance. Denzel's great. No matter the movie, even if the movie isn't good. <coughs> so true. Yeah, so at that point, you already had me on board. It's like Travolta uh, within that resurgence uh, time frame after Pulp. Yes. He got a chance to do you know, a bunch of different movies. And like, yeah. oh, it's him and Denzel. Well, maybe he can, because he'd already done a, a couple clunkers in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that little time frame. But it's just like, oh, okay, this is an interesting, oh, it's an older movie, a Walter Matthau. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Denzel's playing that. And I knew about the backstory, but I hadn't seen the original. Yeah. Just like, nah, shit, that wasn't good. If you want to do Denzel on train, then talk to me about Unstoppable. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, surprisingly, you know That's exactly what that movie is going to be, and somehow it's still really good. It still really works. Yeah, it does. And I, you know, credit Denzel. <laughs> right. I mean, I'd say that the other actors in it weren't really good, but no, no, no. And Chris Pine, I think, is the co lead in that. Yes. But it's like, a, yeah, but if you didn't have Denzel on this, I don't know if I'm buying it as much. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. It's a good point. Well, this guy, uh, this, uh, the guy who directed it, Joseph Sargent, he was directing since 1959. And he directed, he, he directed projects all the way up to 2005. Well, I Whoa. Had, yeah. Like, this guy worked a lot for a long time. Jesus, how old was he in 1974? When did you say he was born? Let's see how, let's see how old he was. He, he was born in 1925. Was 1925. 1925. He, so he was working at 80? He was working at 80. Good for him. <laughs> Good for him. Mostly TV movies. Maybe stuff you've seen before, like Miss Evers' Boys. I don't know if you saw that one. That was an mm. HBO film. But he Maybe. did. Sadly, he did Jaws the Revenge. This is a, it's a paycheck. <laughs> it's a paycheck. You and Mike Kane. Was that Mike Kane's? Or Michael Kane, he... yeah. Yeah, it's fine. You both went, hey, I'd like to live in the Bahamas for three months and get paid for it. <laughs> Not a problem. What's in, uh, did The Hell with Heroes. Um, John, I said movies I might know. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, it's interesting because nothing shows in his resume that he could create such an incredible film like Taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3. Like, nothing. Nothing before or after. Uh, it shows you that I can see here through this whole resume I'm looking at because he do a lot of TV movies, a lot of TV movies and episodes of TV shows. Um, like he did the Karen Carpenter story. Uh, look at this. Oh, somebody's daughter, whatever that is. World War II when lions roared. My Antonio. That sounds familiar. It doesn't. Okay. Streets of Loretto. No. Mandela and de Klerk, which is the one with Michael Caine and uh, Sidney Poitier. Um, crime and Punishment, A Lesson Before Dying. Oh, that sounds familiar. For Love or Country, the Arturo Sandoval story. <laughs> Salem Witch Trials, which is a 2002 movie. Something the Lord Made, which I think is the one with Rickman, where he's teaching the black, or the black doctor like is coming in for the first time to do these kinds of surgeries. I forget who the guy oh, is. Kind of yeah. like the Nick? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But this is a based on a true story. And then I wish War- that show would come back. Oh, the Nick was great. It's man. never going to come back. A Warm Springs, which is the one that was about uh, Re- Roosevelt uh, dealing with his polio with Kenneth Branagh playing Roosevelt. Um, and then mm. his last movie was a TV movie in 2008. This motherfucker... Like, At 83. 83, dude. He's still working. What was the last one called and what was it on? Can you tell? Uh, it was something... Oh, Sweet Nothing in My Ear, a two-hour drama. That sounds like a country music song title. Uh, yeah, a family drama. Something sweet in my ear. <laughs> Something sweet. 
A family drama about a deaf and hearing couple who struggle to decide whether or not to give their deaf son a cochlear implant. Cochlear. Cochlear, sorry, implant. Marley Madeline's in this. Jeff Daniels was in this. What? Interesting. What was this on? Know. Jeff uh, Daniels was in this? Yeah. Uh, David Oyelowo, in a very, as a young actor, was in this. How interesting. Uh, good no, cast. I don't... Uh, did that have release? Yeah, I don't know if you can see what channel uh, it be on it? off IMDb. Okay. Oh, well. oh, Hallmark. It was a Hallmark film. What? Hallmark film. They got that cast for a Hallmark film? <laughs> Sometimes. You got to get that check, man. You got to get that check. That's that's crazy, though. Yeah. Like, the, the checks of the actors was the entire production budget. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> They just shot using reused former Hallmark sets. <laughs> yeah, all of it. They set it up and uh, and put it down. They just put it oh, on. They put the grass in the grass. A buddy there. of mine, uh, uh. he's a writer. He's <laughs> yeah. written on a couple shows, but he was trying to get a job years ago. So he watched a bunch of different Hallmark movies. Oh yeah, and figured out a formula for theirs and wrote a couple scripts specifically targeted to. And it hit like okay, this one is this type of, and it right. needs to hit these specific beats throughout. So he wrote a version of that and like a version of this. <laughs> And a friend of his had an in there, so he got the scripts in front of... And it, they read it. I don't know if it got beyond that, but oh. it was like literally sat down with the math of it and was <laughs> like, all right, so it's a Christmas story, and it's a family that's kind of being torn apart, but this dog comes in and brings them back to... And it was like, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I can see that. I'm down. Yeah, apparently the script's pretty good, but they just, you know, whatever. Yeah. I'm sure they get a lot of good scripts yeah. for cheeseball Hallmark movies. <laughs> write it, write it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I have a friend who is trying to find people because Hallmark's looking for people to write scripts. Like they're, they, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and so he was telling me, like, because a, a couple of friends of ours write animation scripts, he was helping them, like, uh, get in there so they could possibly submit or pitch uh, feature films. Because, fuck it, I mean, it's a paycheck. I would write Hallmark films all day and all night if I could get paid for it. It's, dude, it's the equivalent of... Um, Oh, who are the two uh, characters in Elf? It's Andy Richter. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Kyle uh, Gass. Kyle Gass. Yeah, yeah. Pitching kids stories. Yeah. It's the same thing for Hallmark. Yeah. All right, all right, picture this. <laughs> and you're just in there pitching, and you just pitch these really simple yeah. divorced single mom, right? <laughs> and it's the spring break. And her kids are going away, kind of like, whatever. Right. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Yeah. All right, what about this one? Hear me out. <laughs> Hear me out. It's a mom who's concerned. He, she thinks her daughter is out partying and carousing too much. Yeah. She's a lost soul, and she's got to bring her back. Mother, bring her back. Here's the title. Mother May I Sleep With Danger. Boom. Nailed <laughs> oh, it. Oh, wow. Trump. I think Meredith Baxter Bernie is already attached. Yes, she is. <laughs> She's a little bit old to be the mom, I guess. This is an she adopted made a run. child. She made a run during that time. Oh, she right? was. She, she was, was the face of, of Hallmark for a while. <laughs> Which is interesting because at what point did she come out as a lesbian? Was that oh, after her th Hallmark run? Yeah, I think it was a while after. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know if it had anything to do with yeah, it. Yeah, I had yeah. a crush on her when I was younger. Of course. She was cute. Yeah. She was better than the mom on uh, uh, Growing Pains. Joanna Kearns. Oh, yeah. Not even close. Yeah, not even close. It's Baxter close. Bernie had that little Baxter, cute. She had yeah, something. And apparently her and Michael J. Fox did not get along at all. There was a really? lot. Oh, yeah. You don't know this? Oh, uh -uh. there was a lot. Look it up. But you can Google it if, you, if you're listening and you want to Google it. Matt, you can as well. Like, there was a lot of tension between them. Because... Um, she thought she was the star of the show because she had more pedigree and resume when the show started. Michael okay. J. Fox was a young kid who was, but he caught the, yeah. you know, the public by he storm. Got the, uh, you know, the J.J. Yeah. Walker good times. Right. And so they started changing the scripts to focus on him more. And had that to. really offended her uh, because she's like, well, I was told this was going to be about me and my relationship with Michael Gross, my husband on the big show. It was going to be that. And we were teaching our kids and they started to make it more about that. And the same thing happened with Good Times. John Amos left. Yeah, signed because, up for something else. Yeah, because they were focusing on too much on JJ. And he was like, I can't be part of this shit. He was the breakout hit. Yeah. He was the star. It was if we want to stay on the air, this right. is what the people want. Yeah. I'm sure all those people on fucking Family Matters are like, fuck, I want to tell my story. Sorry, Urkel's killing it. Nah, as soon as we introduce Urkel. Yeah, game although, over. Although, you know, in hindsight, the Reginald Val Johnson, yeah. I would rather have spent time, like, sat in the squad car, done some more stuff oh, with course. him. Of course. Because to me, he was the most engaging character right. on that show. Right. It just became Urkel's because, you know. You got to get views, man. Exactly. And the demographic that that was appealing to was basically young kids. Yeah. That was part of TGIF. Right. 
So it was like, ah, families to do something with kids. And Urkel's a big hit with kids. He is. So terrible. <laughs> now, looking back, I loved it at the time. Of course. But so terrible. I was Urkel one year for uh, Halloween. What? Yeah. Did you go with blackface? Yep. Well, you bastard. Well, I spray painted my hair black. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. You I did that. I did not okay, put okay. shoe polish on okay, my face. Okay, good. Yeah, never do that. But I wore a cardigan sweater and a button-up. <laughs> But not fully, like a three button at the bottom, whatever, an open shirt and walked around. Did you do the catchphrase at any point? Oh, of course. Did I do that? Yeah, I think it was like sixth grade or something. <laughs> One of the last few times I ever trick-or-treated. Even better. Yeah. God, I trick-or-treated up until I was 15 years old. Did you really? I think yeah. maybe seventh grade might have been the last year I trick-or-treated. Yeah. I shouldn't have done that. I had a couple of parents who were like... As a sophomore you were? Yeah, I was trick-or-treating. Wow. Yeah, I was pretty terrible. Like love people, that candy. Yeah, man, I love, love that candy. candy. Still, I tell, uh, my dentist will tell you, I love that candy. But yeah, it, it was, it, we only hit like, I don't know, we hit like a few houses and then like people turned us down for the most part. But a couple people were like, you guys are too old to be doing this. We're like, it's free candy, give it up free candy. We're yeah, still we're, kids. We're not 18, we're still kids, considering. I feel so. bad for kids today, man, because I, I've lived in one oh, neighborhood yeah. here in L.A., but I've heard this from people that live all across the country where they're just kids don't trick or treat as much. No, anymore. no, no, no. His parents don't you feel it's safe. Yeah. And when I was a kid, like, once I got to a certain age, my parents were like, just be home by X. And me and my friends just walked. I'm right. not kidding. Four miles. Yeah. Four miles and hit up as many homes as we possibly could wow. running, filling a pillowcase. That's yeah, what yeah. I used. Yeah. Because it was strong and it was big and I could sling it over my shoulder <laughs> and get as much candy as I could before sure. like nine o'clock before yeah. I got, you know, too late. When I'm coming home and then trading candy and Oh my God, I loved Halloween as a kid. Yeah, man. It was the best. Yeah. Because you, you, you're trying to get as big as much. Like you try to stay out there as long as possible. Yeah. So you come out with the biggest haul, and that would just last you for like days, for weeks. Did you ever have the kids? I knew some kids that yeah. had two costumes one they would wear to school for Halloween, oh. and then one they would wear like that. I, I noticed that oh. more as I got older. Yeah. The last couple of years, like, oh, no, this one I'm wearing today, and then tonight I'm going to this. And you're like, you get to wear two costumes? <laughs> the costume changes. Yeah, in the I even make the sacrifices show. every year. Like, I remember one year oh, yeah. I wanted to be Batman, and there was this badass utility belt. Yeah. It was right after the Michael Keaton uh, Batman, and I was yeah. all things Batman for like the next year and a half. Yeah. I fucking loved it. And it was between this utility belt or like, Cow plus cape plus like gl- <laughs> gloves, and yeah. otherwise I'd have to make do with a cape I had previously yeah. and this really shitty mask. And I was like, I want that utility belt because <laughs> that thing is awesome. So the rest of my costume was pretty shit. Yeah, but this utility belt, trust me, me and my friends were like, this is awesome. <laughs> I got this gun that could shoot instead of shooting the grappling hook, it'd shoot a dart. Yeah, and uh, just stupid little add-ons. I love that thing. That's brilliant, dude. Yeah, so to have two, I remember that. It's like, wow, you got two. Yeah, I never got two. Fuck no, no. no. And I hated dressing up in Halloween for school. I liked doing it at night. I didn't like it in the day. You know. So. Uh, they didn't do it for when I was really little. And I oh, guess yeah? maybe school started to once I got a few years older. Gotcha. Like yeah. First, second, third grade. I don't remember anybody doing it. Oh, Halloween. really? Oh, uh, yeah. Always had to have something. You know, you buy it something. At tar- like, well, you know, we didn't make a lot of money when I was a kid. So Kmart. We had to go to Kmart and buy shit at Kmart sure. to put it on, you know. Yeah, we had the, I lived in West Virginia at the time. We had a place called Hills that was the equivalent oh, of Kmart. Right on. Did you have Hills? You're not too far from where I live. No, I don't. But I know places like that. Ours was, uh, we had a Memco. Okay. We had a, I don't know uh, Memco. We had a, um, it's, not, it's something that started with a Z, but it's not, it's not Zales. Like the, it, it was yeah, something Zales. else. It was something else. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Did you have Rex or Rax, Raxes? The competitor Arby's. Oh, no, we had Arby's. No, we had Arby's. Yeah. But then we had its apparent arch rifle, uh, ri- rival <laughs> yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. Called, I think it was Rax, R-A-X. Are you, sure they, are you sure they weren't part of the corporation? They just changed their name for that region? Because that ha- does happen. Yeah, Hardy's was Roy Rogers where I was. Where I grew up, okay. Hardee's was Out Roy here Rogers. it's Carl's Jr. Right, Hardee's. Carl's Jr., right. There was no Hardee's where I grew well, up. Well, it's because one bought out the other. They subsumed. Uh, yeah. So instead of changing the name and getting a new populace acclimated to, right. they just own that fucking thing. Well, the fucking food was the same. Yeah. They, you, eventually, you yeah. shift the menu over to, hey, we got the quarter pound this, blah, yeah. blah, blah. <laughs> when I drove down to, yeah, when I, when I was down in uh, South Carolina and down in Florida, I was like, what the fuck is Hardee's? And then I looked, I was like, holy shit. The exact same menu as Roy Rogers. And so it was just a mind-blowing experience to know that they, they just change from region to region. It's interesting. you know. Hardee's so. was ghetto shit where I lived. Oh, yeah? Just like 
not indicating where it was. Right, right, right. Just the connotation of like, if you want the crap kind of food, fast food, yeah. that's where you go for fast food. Yeah. I never went to Hardee's. I hated it when we ate Hardee's. <laughs> like, really? Hardee's? Wendy's is right over there. We all agree that How dare you? their burgers are way better. Or McDonald's is across the street and their fries are better than anything on this menu. Right, right. Uh, What's worse than Carl's? Oh, Jack in the Box. I kind of don't like Jack in the Box. I think had I grown up out here, yeah. I, could, I could understand because I got a buddy that loves the two tacos for a buck. Or oh, whatever. really? I don't know if it's still the same, but those things, I've never had one because they look like the most disgusting yes. Yes. things you've ever seen in your life. It's like, oh, two tacos for a buck. And you're like, no, those are not tacos. <laughs> I don't care those what you say. Tacos. Those are not tacos. They're just disgusting fried <laughs> like wafer with weird right. food in the middle. Right. Well, Roy Rogers, when I was like, that's where you got the biscuits, not McDonald's. McDonald's didn't do biscuits. Hardee's did have good biscuits. Right. Hardee's a great fucking that biscuits. That I will give them. Yeah, man. Their biscuits were the bomb. Yep. Bomb dig it. But I didn't know that until I stopped basically eating uh, fast food breakfast because that's my all time favorite. Oh, dude. It's my, f- I, you know. Matt knows I still do it every once in a while. Get that uh, McDonald's, get the biscuit. Get I almost. I'm shaking uh, cheese, man. Two days ago, in the, after all this, I've been working nonstop. Yeah. I, yeah. I lost weight. Jesus. Yeah. Wow, it's good. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, but at the same time, like my left shoulder is killing me today. Yeah. My right knee is actually a little bit swollen. This morning, I couldn't. Uh, I text my wife. My hands were so uh, basically just tired. Yeah, I couldn't write it first. I couldn't <laughs> hold the pen oh, and like God. I looked down at my hands and they're just slightly like slightly quivering or whatnot. Yeah. But they're just tired. Damn, dude. My whole body is just like you. You need to fucking. <laughs> you done. it's done. Yeah. Oh, good. It's all fucking over. Okay. But uh, maybe you'll tell us about it one day. I'll tell you about it. Okay. I just right. I, I, don't, I don't find it That's interesting fair. for from an audio. Th- yeah. It's it's nothing to them. Well, you know, people love hearing you talk about stuff. You know, well, you as tell well. You they want to yeah. get behind the curtain, and I, yeah. I don't mind. Like I'll yeah. happily tell you a good story, but it's just not a good story. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Well, let's wrap it up there, man. We're at forty five minutes. Uh, this has been a very long uh, Thunderdome. So uh, once again, thanks to those to the uh, three patrons. You want to name? Yeah, to Frank Montoya, Eric Grebner, and Mitch Newman. Congrats, Mitch, yeah. uh, for winning in the poll and Frank uh, for winning overall since you get to that's I consider that first winner I agree so they get to choose uh, Thunder Blunder and then what the topic will be so this time it was Walter Matthau other times it's been you know movie genres or directors or whatever the case is however uh, you want to define it we've done silent movies we've done it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We've done it all. You pick the topic and whether or not you want to yeah. praise it or crap on it. But taking Pelham one, two, three is is excellent. Yeah, so it was a really good movie choice. Interesting Absolutely. topic. Both good movies. So thank you to all three. If you'd like to participate in Thunderdomes in the future, um, you just have to go on our Patreon, and it's at the twenty dollar level. And that also at the twenty, you get a shout out at the end of the month on the show, mm-hmm. and you also get uh, the backlogged older classic episodes that yeah. come out every Wednesday. There'll be a new one this upcoming Wednesday. And uh, if you donate, you don't get access to them now. You get access to it next month once Patreon's actually charged you for something. Yeah. Um, you know. So if you want to participate, that'd be awesome. Uh, it's, every month we, we keep adding more and more competitors. I think there was 30-something on this one. Yeah, that's that great. That number of eligible people that, that want to participate. Really appreciate and, uh, it. Yeah. Th- so thank you to all of you. And if you want to follow me online at uh, any social networking type of thing, it is Matt Nost, at Matt Nost, M-A-T-T-K-N-O-S-T. And you can uh, hit us up on Facebook. Let us know what you thought of this show or any show um, at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the top 10 show with the number 10. Boom. And you can find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram and everything Matt said I echo. And also, uh, do we give the address for the Patreon? www.patreon.com no. backslash the top 10. I have been number to 10. bring this up for like a year. Uh-huh. It is forward slash. Oh, forward slash. Backslash means back towards your hard drive. Forward oh. slash means basically out into the world. I apologize. Forward slash the top 10. Um, and there. And you can donate there. And there are multiple, there are multiple tiers there that you can donate. And uh, we've got stuff coming down the pipe. I know we keep saying that, but we do. We, we do. really do. We really now do. that my yeah. schedule is freed up and I can help uh, John, uh, we can basically we go back to being a out. partnership. Yeah. <laughs> He's been carrying my water Don't for a couple of weeks Don't now. Don't say that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we uh, t-shirts are coming. Yeah. T-shirts are actually coming. We uh, scoped happen. out numerous websites. We know who we're going to be using. We have a long-term uh, goal on that as well. Yeah. Uh, I got some ideas to talk to John about off air about yeah. in regards to more t-shirts in the future. Uh, I was thinking about it. <laughs> spending long days. <laughs> um, 
So anyway, yeah, uh, be on the lookout for that. But thank you so much to everybody that participated and listened to us. And yeah. uh, let us know what you think on uh, Twitter or Facebook. And uh, that's it for me. Yeah, that's it for me, too. Thanks, everybody, listening. Uh, we will by talk the way, to you. did we ever introduce ourselves? I don't think we did. Yeah, we must have. I don't believe we oh, did. Well, this was John Roca. And I am Matt Nost. And that, this was Thunderdome. Thunderdome.